And ultimately, I'd lose my shirt because I would not have built that site to a specification. Mm -hmm. Right. And that specification needs to include, needs to, needs to address your objectives and all of the, the whole of the website from the functionality to the look to it, the SEO opportunities to the, you know, all of the things that you think you wanted to do needs to be specified before mm -hmm. you start building it. Right. Absolutely. And most of the time, people starting a new business really don't have an objective for their website other than I need to be out there. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Endless Coffee Cup, a regular discussion of marketing news, culture, and media for our complex digital lifestyle. Join Matt Bailey as he engages in conversation to find insights beyond the latest headlines and deeper understanding for those involved in marketing. Grab a cup of coffee, have a seat, and thanks for joining. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Endless Coffee Cup. And just as a throwback here, one of our most popular shows was one we did on entrepreneurship. And this was back in the days when, when Sue Grabowski was visiting quite often before she got busy. And lo and behold, Sue is back with us. I'm glad to be here. I am so glad you are back as well, Sue. It's so good to see you. Nice to see you too. <laughs> I didn't mean to put nice you know to any seen. <laughs> any pressure on you with that introduction. No, it's all good. It's the <laughs> truth. It's the it's the experience of the entrepreneur to have seasons of craziness, and I've had some seasons of that. But I I think we're whipping it back into shape. Absolutely. I realized as I texted you. And, and so, dear listener, this is the setup. Sue and I talked on December 26th, which was a Sunday and, you know, with the Christmas holiday and everything. And of course, we're talking work. And I summed up the conversation by saying, okay, that's the definition of entrepreneurship. The Sunday, December 26th, you're working. Exactly. There is, it, someone asks me, well, people ask all the time, does it ever shut off? And the answer is no. No, it doesn't. That's not a negative mm -hmm. that it never shuts off, but it doesn't. And so I couldn't help but get up the day after Christmas and go, I have things I've got to get done. Right. And I originally <laughs> texted, texted you about some work. <laughs> and then I, you're like texting me back and you, wait a minute, I'm just going to call you because we're both sitting at our desks. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, and I always realized that was the danger. So you and I have both entrepreneurs, both had agencies and working through that, and I remember one of the first things I did was we had a family computer in the living room, and as soon as, you know, you've got broadband, I would come home from work, and I couldn't walk past that computer without checking my email. Yeah. It was just a a constant, because it is like a 24-hour yeah. well, clock that you've got to <laughs> watch. It, it is. I. It's strange this past two years, because... When I first started the business 25 years ago, this coming March, which is amazing, I worked out of my home and a tiny a tiny house at that point as far as we were just getting started. But I found that I was, you know, never shutting it off. And so I would I would had I would keep things in the office. At that point we were landlined, you know, yes. so I was on AOL oh, yes. at that time, which <laughs> it's crazy to think that that was 25 years ago. It feels like centuries ago, right? Yeah, but that right. was I had a telephone line hookup. So I didn't have the ease of moving the computer around at that point, but I did I did keep going back there and I put in my in my head, I'm gonna turn off the light at the end of the day. That's the end of my oh. day. Because I had little kids and it's mm -hmm. like I had to shut it off. Now, I mean it's I didn't have a, a cell phone then that had any kind of email checking ability or anything like that. I think it's gotten worse. But I worked at home for six years. And then started moving out to an office as I added employees and moved to spaces. And over the last three years, I would say, because we started this process even before COVID, I'm back in my office again, <laughs> where it is always sitting there and on my phone. And, and I found that I have to put the technology in a space, put yeah. the devices in a space with that virtual turn the light off to step away from it and 
be present with my family, be present for certain things because it's just, it's way more there, quote unquote, mm-hmm. there, air quotes, than it even was when I first Absolutely. started. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, when I, mobile phones, when I guess when it started becoming a real thing, I had them, you know, on and off, but then when it was finally for work, I was so happy to realize that one of the houses where we lived when I was working for someone else, it was out of signal. (laughs) And so in order to get a signal, I had to go about 500 feet outside the front door up in the hill. Requires some effort. Yeah. (laughs) And then like, this is awesome. No one can reach me at night. But, you know, at that point, it still wasn't that prevalent. But now I understand exactly what you say. It's It's got to be that space and you have to be able to walk away from it. You have to consciously do it. But it never goes out of your head. Oh, I, I keep mean, my to keep my iPhone in my back pocket. Yeah. Uh, and it's... same thing here. And <laughs> yeah. it's so it never is. It never goes out. You have to consciously separate from it. But there's also a love for it. Yeah. Meaning that it never goes out of your head. It's it's not something that's nagging all the time. It's just there. Well, and what I've been experiencing, especially I would say the past couple of months, is this is the first time I've been able to work on my stuff, my website, my marketing, my, you know, you, you know, I'm, I'm putting more I'm into the podcast <laughs> it, it, and it's just. You know, and I'm telling my kids, I hard-coded, you know, I'm going to go geek out. I hard-coded some forms into my website, and now spam bots are getting it. And so I've got to go back through 15 years of blog posts and find all these forms. And, oh, while I'm there, oh, the sidebar needs updated. Oh, the de- oh the design. Oh, what did I think? You know, and, and, and even running into some blog posts that, oh, that didn't age well. You know, it's it's about an event and something that happened in the past and the relevance just isn't there. So it's it's a lot of housekeeping. That's what my holidays have been. Right. <laughs> is, yeah. Is taking care of that kind of stuff. I should have spent more time over the holidays doing that. I guess I still have this week. But yeah, I'm still the shoemaker's child. I I, I Right. Are we don't get to our stuff. We are busy on client work and it's funny I get I'll get asked things about my own website or my own social media or my own mm-hmm. whatever and I'm like I'm busy with client work so right. I could do it for a client in no time flat that's correct but now I sit out there and I'm building automations and drip campaigns and and I'm banging my head against the wall yeah it, you know it's so easy to and I think that's that outside perspective of I've got the experience, I've seen this before, or let me tell you what works. And but yet for your own I am a marketing consultant, I am a trainer, I've never worked on any kind of client like that. Right. <laughs> you know? I think that we are really self critical. I find that I get very critical about even the smallest social media posts. I, I do what I tell my clients not to do. Which is, I understand that. you yeah. know, getting the news out or getting the information out is more important. Good enough Good enough is more important than not <laughs> at all. And I find myself being incredibly self-critiquing and nitpicking. Even if I have some of my team members, you know, copyright some things or whatever, I am extremely particular when it comes to my own stuff. And then it doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Because we go right back to client work. Yeah. And as entrepreneurs, I mean, the fact is you have to go where the money is. Mm -hmm. There is. Absolutely. Now, I don't and I don't really realize that the money is in me (laughs) and I really need to go where the money is, which is putting that investing in in my in my own stuff. But you you go where the money is. Right. Well, and that's, you know, I'm working on my stuff. I got an email and a phone call. My stuff went on. The burn, back yeah. burner, you know, it, immediately there's that priority list and it just so happened I had the time to work on it, but then something came up and things moved, but things switch. And now I'm like, well, how do I sub this out? Yeah. <laughs> and the acceleration, once you drop that ball mm-hmm. to pick that back up, it requires three times the energy, I think. It, yes. To go back to that than it is to go to the next to-do list item for your client. Mm-hmm. And that's where there needs to be balance, accountability. You know, there are some things that only the business owner can do. Yeah. 
there's other things you can sub out, right? Mm -hmm. But you, I just find that if I have to dive back into my own stuff, for some reason that requires a lot more effort right. than some of the other things that I have to work on. So That is so true. That is. So, uh, listener, just to cue you in, one of the reasons Sue is here is, and I mentioned it earlier, one of our best performing podcasts was on entrepreneurship. And I saw a news article just the other day about there have been more searches on Google for how to start a business than how to find a job. That was really interesting. And they, and they showed a couple, there was a couple variations of that. But the reality of it was, is more people are looking to start a business out of this pandemic. And, and, and it was interesting, and I think you know this as well, some of the most successful businesses ever started we're in an economic downturn. Right. And so it's no surprise. More people, there's more opportunities now. There's Absolutely. more business opportunities. Why go back to work for somebody else when you've got the skills and knowledge or to the passion to go do something? And so we're rehashing our entrepreneurship episode with a new updated post COVID. Yeah. Are we still, po we're not post COVID. No, I think we're, we're still mid, mid, -COVID. mid COVID. I don't, I don't think we're, yeah. we're not out of it. Um, it'll be a while it'll be yeah yeah so yeah let's talk on we've already talked about the the birth you know the good introduction on entrepreneurship here's what you have to look forward to yeah but there there are obviously ups and downs of what you have to deal with and one of the things that i saw in this article it was talking about people starting a business number one website what are you going to do about the website how are you going to handle that and oh my goodness we uh, talking to Sue, and it was our conversation. <laughs> was how do you handle this when clients come to you? And you know, I think I can build it myself. I think is one we hear a lot. Yes, uh, I've got a friend. And the answer to that is, you can. Yeah, <laughs> you absolutely you can. absolutely can. Yes, well, and and I've dealt with this for a couple of years. Ever since WordPress came out, people are saying, "Well, WordPress is free." Well, absolutely, it is. Sure. Do you know how to? <laughs> install it, optimize it. Do you know what plugins are essential? And then, and then, yeah, I can go buy a template. Yes, you can. However, just because these templates are available, some are popular, doesn't mean they fit what you're trying to do. Right. And it doesn't always mean that the designer of those templates understood conversion, understood uh, contrast, color, they may look pretty and they might be nice colors, but is it designed to sell? Is it designed to connect? No, Nobody to even knows what they want their website to do mm. for them in terms of a an objective overall. What do I want my site to do for me? I just had a, a meeting last week with a potential new client and smaller business starting their own kind of two entities kind of coming together and they called me and said, they, I love this. I need a website. That's the first thing. <laughs> and my second answer, my, my first question to them is why? Because based on the audience that you're going for, what, what is it? Why do you need a website? Well, we, I said, what do you want it to do for you? And this person said, I want it to make the phone ring. And I said, well, a website's not going to do that for you. Well, yeah. Well, and it's funny because I'm sitting here like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And because, yeah, to me, a website's the foundation of I, I mean, You need to have it. Absolutely. But if your expectation is, if we build it, they will come. Right. You're way wrong, and we've got to drive them there, yeah. right? This is not Field of Dreams. But <laughs> but in the course of the yeah. conversation, I mean, back to what you're saying, they're like, well, you know, I could do this myself, mm -hmm. but I'm calling you. And I'm like, well, why are you calling me? What what can't you do? What What do you think that I'm going to do? that you can't. And we dive, start diving into more questions. And I'll tell you, as I've, this is learning from as an entrepreneur over the years, in the past, I said, okay. Yes. No problem. Yes. I'll do that for you. And ultimately, I'd lose my shirt because I would not have built that site to a specification. Mm-hmm. Right. And that specification needs to include, needs to, needs to address your objectives and all of the the whole of the website from the functionality to the look to it, the seo opportunities to the 
you know, all of the things that you think you wanted to do needs to be specified before mm -hmm. you start building it. Right. Absolutely. And most of the time, people starting a new business really don't have an objective for their website other than I need to be out there. Mm -hmm. I want to sell stuff. I want to, yeah, exactly. People need to find me on the web. I need to look legitimate. And that's just something that it's it's been fascinating to me because when they come to me, I'm like, you could build your own. It's two ways, right? Mm -hmm. You could build your own or I constantly get from small business, new business starter ups. I could do it myself, you know. <laughs> then why are you calling me? Right. Absolutely. And that I, I think so that spec is so critically important and the expectations of what this is going yes. to do for you. That is so, so important. I, I remember being in a meeting with someone and it's an established business. They had a website, but now they, here's what we want to do with it. We're going to expand it. We're going to grow and we're developing the marketing of, okay, how is this going to happen? Where do we invest? What do we do? All of a sudden they, they come out with a statement. We're probably three hours into this workshop of how we're going to do that. And they come up with a statement that, well, I mean, our hope is that we get bought out in two years. Uh, oh, what? I, I It stopped everything because, you know, we're we're looking at search engine optimization. However, that's like a two year for a new website. Right. It's a minimum two year before you start seeing any kind of return. And so now you've changed everything why would we invest in seo if your plan is to sell this company and you see it happening in two years whoa now we're re well now we're going into paid search we're going into you know digital advertising we're using other channels that have a more immediate impact right maybe you know and we can build it with some seo but it's not going to be high on the list it completely transformed how we're going to handle this now and where we put the emphasis. And so, I, to your point, asking those questions, what do you want to do out of it? What's your expectation? What do you want to accomplish with it? I won't build a website now without a spec. Yeah. I mean, that's step one in the website development process. And then if they bless the spec, we do what's what we call a value requirement specification. Mm -hmm. What has to be there to deliver value? Mm -hmm to you, we we specify that all. That moves then to a functional spec. How does that work in a wireframe and a functional, you know, when it's actually played out? But you're gonna bless this first, and mm -hmm. we aren't writing a lick of code. Yep. And I probably sound like a, a bit rigid and harsh, but in the end, we both lose mm -hmm. without that. Yeah. I lose money because I keep saying, sure, we can add that, yeah, we can add that after because what would happen was we would just build the site and it would take forever and then they'd, they'd take a look at it and they'd go, oh, that's awesome. Can I add a button over here? And I say, <laughs> yeah, for six grand because it wasn't in the wireframe or whatever. And what? We don't, it's not even live yet. So to make the client happy, mm -hmm. I would keep giving. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they're not happy. And in the end, I'm not happy. So why don't we both start out being happy? But that's yeah. lessons along the road. That is business partnership at this point with a software engineer who has helped me see the value of specifications and you know process and all the things that I think agencies fail at. Mm -hmm. But I just, I, I think that, I guess I would say, and you, you can contradict me, this would be a good conversation here. If you're starting a new business and you want to get a website out there, throw a page up there. Go go do it. Get something <laughs> out there so that people can find you and yes. contact you. And then really map it out and think long term. What mm -hmm. I'm stuck on and what nobody gets is SEO takes two years at least, yeah. at a minimum. And nobody says that. Mm -hmm. There are places promising oh. that faster. And so when you're when you're starting a business, the balance of the immediate need for it, revenue mm -hmm. and building, balancing that with an eye on the long haul is really difficult for entrepreneurs. Oh. We, well, it's it's difficult for agencies because and, and this is something I see all the time is once the website is built, 
the agency is ready to wipe their hands. We're done. Website's done. Here, here you are. It's, it's like delivered. Yeah. <laughs> and you know this. A website is never, it's never done. done. You're testing things. You're growing things. You're realizing, you know what? People don't like this. They're not responding to it. I need to change that. I need That button needs to be bigger and more appealing and higher contrast. There are always things you're learning about the site. There are always things that need to change. And so that is one of the problems, I think, with an agency relationship or... Uh, Website vendor relationship, yeah. Yeah, vendor relationship it's, is who's going to maintain this. Yeah, and, and that's not discussed often. No, no, not at all. Because what I hear from clients, so I inherit, as an agency owner, I inherit a lot of websites oh, from my clients. Yeah. And what they'll say to me, they'll come to me, I have one that recently came and, and they're, they've got some investors in the company and they the investors want SEO. We want SEO, we want SEO. We look at the website. The way that it was built does it's not conducive to right. that, right? But the the client and I feel for them. I really do. Like you can't see this. My hands on my heart, right? <laughs> it I, is. You I, are in pain. <laughs> I feel for them because they say, "I just spent sixty thousand dollars on that. Mm -hmm. I just spent all this money on that, and you're telling me it's not right." But I have to go back and say, "Was it built to a spec? Did it have SEO in mind when it was built?" The answer is no. We needed a website fast. We got it built. I knew a friend, mm -hmm. I had a relative, I knew someone who did this, and that's what we did. And then they're looking to me to be the savior, and I'm trying to say to them, one, your site's not built right to do that. Two, if you want to invest in SEO, that means you've got to look at a lot of content things. Someone's got to feed the beast. You have a beast. You actually bought a beast of a thing, and now that beast needs fed. <laughs> And no one talks to their clients about this is not a once and done thing, but both the client mm -hmm. who wants to invest in it and in most cases, the agency that's going to deliver that thinks it's a single transaction. Right. And right. once that goes live, quote unquote, I step back as the agency and the client thinks it's running, but it's... I mean, I don't we're totally off the entrepreneurship thing. Well, no, but it, I mean, but it is. This is critical stuff to know. Yeah, you need to think again. Think both short term and long term yeah. when you're starting a business. Mm -hmm. I so I'm, I'm sure you've seen this as well, and, and I love your your your, your illusion to feed the beast feed because the beast. that's what it is. It is when you get a friend, when you get that person who oh, I build websites because what you're doing is you're locking yourself in long term to one person who built it to their spec, yes. their idea of what this happens. And I have run into so many businesses, and not just small businesses, corporate, Fortune 500, yes. where one person was doing it their own without any guidance, supervision. They were It was all in their head. They built the database according to their vision of their spec. They didn't have to report to anyone and now they're gone. Who understands this database? How are we going to use it? How are we going to... And I've seen this in websites where they go with one programmer and they're using an e-commerce software package that's no longer being used. And rather than switch and update, they keep rebuilding and patching this together with duct tape and chicken wire and bubble gum. And as a, as a result... What I've seen is people change their entire business model to accommodate <laughs> a, a programmer or a friend or a, a software package, and it harms their business. Yes. And so there's a danger of having just all <laughs> all my eggs in one basket. One person can do all this. And You're held hostage. You are, because this is going to be a relationship that you have as long as your website is up. That's right. You are you are held hostage, and I have seen it far too too often. And I think the biggest problem is again startup startup businesses. You are running on a on a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. so you're trying to get things done as cheaply as possible. But you are not thinking about transportability. You're not thinking about process. You're not thinking about what if that person isn't here, and that has to be one of your considerations in your spec. Mm -hmm in that this cannot be tied to a single person, entity, software platform. 
I need to be able to move this when I need to move it. And it's something that entrepreneurs, I would say myself, right? you become incredibly short-sighted because you're just trying to get things done at the lowest cost mm-hmm. and to meet the lowest short-term expectations. Yeah. And you're totally right that it's the other, if you, if you have your friend or your brother do it, right, it's their vision. Mm-hmm. And then it can cause, you don't want to add on some personal emotional oh, baggage yeah. in the midst of trying to start up a business. Mm-hmm. Because when you want to move that, you face offense. Yeah, on absolutely. the other person's part. So if you go into it more clinically, I mean, I guess one of my learnings from the road as someone who is a creative type and a, sorry, typical female in many ways, but atypical in others. But <laughs> I have derived a lot of success out of emotion. I vibe with people. They get me. I sell things. That's, that's sales. There's a vibe there, right? I have learned along the way that my need to be more of a critical thinker be more logical and be more clinical regarding my decision making as a business owner. It's really important to drop some of the emotional stuff. And when we're starting a business, we're highly emotional because we're energized by the anticipation and the excitement of it. And there's emotion tied to that. And you really need to stop, step back as, as an entrepreneur and be logical. And one of those things is, okay, For example, when I'm building a website, when I'm choosing an accountant, when I'm choosing a lawyer, because I always say, have a good accountant and a good lawyer, Mm -hmm. no matter what size your business, because (laughs) you you need those two things. Right. But again, hiring an accountant that's your friend or your brother or your whatever, at first, because it sounds easy, can cause you problems. Be logical, be clinical. And think, of, if I really want this business to grow and scale, mm-hmm. I have to strip away the emotion of it and look strictly at the objective and the specification. There should be a specification for everything you're doing. I couldn't agree more. I, well, the accountant side, I could go down stories. And, and yeah, absolutely. You've got to look at it clinically. I'm not going to hire an accountant through which I have some sort of an emotional relational yes your cousin might be a good accountant this that is one area where you absolutely get what you pay for i 100 a great accountant and it it was part of our conversation a great accountant does certain things they understand what you're doing they they coach you they prepare you it's not just doing books it's it's a business advisor yes to help you spend more efficiently and a great accountant. I, I, I mean, I I love my accountant. She has saved our bacon so many times. I, I you know, she's they, proactive. Proactive, your, and, and they also, if you do make a mistake, they help you through it. That's right. Because they see it all the time. And you can be friendly. Yeah. With your accountant, but again, I mean, this is a strange thing. Because I surrounded myself sometimes with with friends, family, people, resources, and that's what most entrepreneurs do. Is as I as I look at, so I'm I am a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization, which is a global organization. There are local chapters, and I joined like two years ago. I wish, I so wish, I would have known about this mm. decades ago. Yeah, decades ago. I'm going to tout it on here because. I found so much value in it. But what I see is these commonalities among my peers in this group. And we we build our businesses based on our own skill sets. And we add people to whether that's employees or contractors or resources. As we go along, they bring their, their skill sets to yours. Mm-hmm. And it is lovely. It's a lovely way to grow a business until it's not. <laughs> because when you have single sources of all knowledge in particular areas mm-hmm. accounting legal operations it's just any anything where only one person knows that aspect you are you put yourself and your business at risk mm-hmm. because that person can either one leave and you lose all that knowledge right or two they build fiefdoms <laughs> they camp 
Mm -hmm. And those are really hard to break down. And I also found as my business grew, because I surrounded myself with those people who knew me, you get a little bit of resentment. Let's say you have the cousin doing your accounting. Mm -hmm. And they start to see your business grow. Now, while they can say they are unbiased, not moved, <laughs> are they? Do you want that known in the family? Do you want that known in the family? Yeah, yeah. And I strongly recommend being very careful about familial relationships in your small business. Yeah. But it's a natural tendency to do that. Oh, absolutely. And I'm in, so one of EO's benefits is Forum. Mm -hmm. They have, I meet with a small group of non-competing business owners once a month. Cone of silence. We are we have structured ways of sharing because we would all just tell each other what to do because we're all type A's, <laughs> right? But what I have found are consistent tales of woe of family relationships gone bad. Friends, Of family. friend relationships yep. gone bad. Of having to separate from people that you love mm -hmm. but who no longer fit because the business owner may be going in a different direction or something goes awry. And you it's hard when you're starting a business to look that far out. It, it, well, so, so one of the best pieces of advice I got very early, someone told me the people that get you to a million in sales are not going to be the people that get you to five million. And I, am, well, you know, at first side. I was like, really? Wow. You know, and then as I'm on my journey, I'm like, oh, that's why is and and i always thought it was interesting so the first people you hire are people close to you friends family they're immediate they need a job someone needs a job yes. you know so you're kind of getting there right maybe you're bringing in people from the outside but what it is is you've got this vision and you're motivating them you're you're getting people that are willing to work for less because i'm signing on to you you and your vision. Yes. That's why I'm here. It's exciting. It's second generation of hires. As a regular listener of the Endless Coffee Cup, you know that I am passionate about learning and teaching others. With that, I've launched my own education portal for marketing professionals. It's at learn.sitelogic.com. I'm creating and launching a series of courses on analytics. The first course is how to create an analytics strategy that aligns to your business objectives. The second course is six analytics skills that turn data into insights. The third course, launching in just a few weeks, is how to eliminate data overload and improve your presentations. This final course teaches you how to speak the language of the C-suite in your presentations, making you more persuasive, powerful, and effective in your marketing role. You'll also find short topics on data, Google algorithms, and local SEO. And finally, the centerpiece is the OMCA certification course. This is a 40-hour coached course that provides you with a solid digital marketing foundation. At the successful conclusion of this course, you are eligible to sit for the OMCA exam, and you'll receive a free voucher for the exam. $225 value that is included with your course enrollment. I'm an advocate of the OMCA certification as OMCA certified marketers make 16 to 25% more than their non-certified co-workers. The OMCA is proof of your skills and knowledge in this industry. Go to learn.sitelogic.com right now to accelerate your marketing career. They get that as well. They're, they're, they're split between, yeah, I get your vision, and yeah, I'm here for a job. And they get they, yeah. they get the excitement, and, and they're, they're good leaders. The third generation of hires, they don't care about your vision. I'm here for a paycheck. Yeah. Because you're not communicating to them one-on-one. -on -one. Correct. You are communicating to that Through. first and second level, right. the third level, so they're not going to catch the vision. The, they might, you know, respect you, you know, be motivated by you. I'm bottom end of the day. I'm here for a paycheck, and so there's that nuance that goes along with it. 
But it's also some of those third level people are the ones that, you know, because they're here for a paycheck, they're the ones that you can, they're the ones that'll probably get you further. Yes. Because they want to see things grow. They want to see their paycheck grow. And they've got some skills. And levels one and two can really resent you as you as your vision changes. Mm -hmm. Because after you hit a million dollars in sales, your vision does change. Mm -hmm. And if you have any hope of sustainability, succession, your vision has to change. Absolutely. It yeah. has to change. And my company went through that a few years ago, and it was incredibly painful for all involved. Not just me. But there was also the sense of there, there was a resistance to the vision change and some entitlement mm -hmm. related to, well, we got you to this point. Yeah. We, we need to be heard. And yet I had to I had to execute in terms of I, I hear you. I still am saying I'm going this direction. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I think that the third generation of employees, while they are there for the check, because they are self-motivated, mm. there's a different level of value, mm -hmm. a different type of value. Once they're they not level. as an emotionally attached. No, they're not. So you're going to change direction? Cool. Let's my, go. My checks stay the same? Yeah. Is it going to go up? If yeah. you change direction, I'm in. Right. There's not a lot of that. That's that, that emotional entanglement yeah. starts at, at one and two, and I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is not talked about mm. to new business owners. Because, yeah. again, my site is so short when I'm starting that business. I need to get some clients or some customers. I need to make some sales. I need to see that this is You're a the viable. engine. That's the thing. You, the entrepreneur, are the engine. And for that first, you know, millions a kind of a random indicator. It's a good one. But I it's mean, a, it's that's, an, what yeah. EO, that's what EO defines as, yeah. as a as a marker. Okay. So you but you're the engine. You are the engine. You are all the parts because you are sales. You are yes. operations. You are making the decisions of how everything should run. And to then get past that, you can't be the engine. It is Physically, emotionally, impossible. everything impossible for you to be the engine that gets past that to that next stage. You need people who can become parts of the engine as you pull back and now you're driving. <laughs> you need, yeah, you're driving and pushing the gas, but the rest of the things need to work. And yeah. that's where process comes into play. Again, we are now highly process focused as an as an organization and again do full credit to rob kemmer who is my business partner and he the balance of my people skills and his process skills are producing something altogether new for our agency and have been for the last few years but that's it's the process that's going to make the engine work it's the yeah. it's the predictability of those pinions pinions is that the right word those Pistons. There you Pinions. go. Yeah, I'm like, there is a pistons. Pinion. I think that's like old cars have that. Pinions. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I'm not a car guy. I'm just picturing <laughs> pistons going up yes. and down an engine. The predictability of that is created through process. Mm -hmm. And your third generation, at least in my experience, my third generation employees are really globbing on to process. They love it mm -hmm. because they can point to something and go, oh, I do, I do that. Yeah. So there's less question, and and when there's less questions, there's less emotion, mm -hmm. there's less drama, and we can make things run. But yeah. but I don't know, you know, now that we're talking about them, it's really kind of revelatory for me right now in this moment that levels one and two had to happen as painful, and I mean, worst part of my life, as painful as that is. I don't I don't know that we could get to where we are now and where I think we're going without going through that. And that doesn't yeah. mean that they're sacrifices. That doesn't mean that. But mm -hmm. I'm just saying now that you're describing that, I think I think you're right that if you want to move to that next level, you really that that's just part of the process. Well, you're you're building the car to look to keep the metaphor going. Yeah. With People immediately around you. And again, we're, you tap friends and family, good or bad. Right. That's what people do. And and, and we're saying, I think what we're saying is you can, be a, but be aware. Yeah. 
this could happen. Yeah. There could be some resentment. There could be an emotional tie to things. What happens, though, in that in that first and second circle is you have people filling positions that they may not be qualified to do as the business gets bigger. Absolutely. And that's not their fault. It right, just is right. Now I've been fortunate. I had a couple of early hires that oh wonderful. You know, you know, and, and I look at one and you know, she's like VP of marketing now. I would have loved to have hired her. I can't afford her now. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, yeah. I could afford her, you know, fifteen years ago, not now. But they're they're but when you get that close family and friend or something that, that there can be just kind of that resistance along the way. And so just as long as you're aware going into it, you know this could happen. That potential is there. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's, it can be like Velcro pulling things apart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a, I, I attended the Global Speakers Academy for, for Entrepreneurs Organization, mm-hmm. for EO. And I'm a certified global speaker for EO, which is crazy because it was amazing training. But what my kind of keynote speech is on is on growing your business from the inside out with mm. with process and identifying the problems that occur there. And again, I, it's, I got a lot of nods from the entrepreneurs that I deliver this to because it's either so the two issues i see is one you've got single sources of knowledge and what problems that can create and there's a lot of them and then the second one is mystery mistakes <laughs> so you know you've got this problem when there's errors happening but nobody knows really how it happened <laughs> can't point to anyone because you don't have process to be able to identify that it's step six Things went off the rails, right? So it's like I would walk into – this is when the big transformation started to happen at my place. I would walk back from being on a business trip where you know some of my tier one and tier two employees thought that I was just out gallivanting as it, I was yeah. quoted. I was out gallivanting. Not ever seeing that I was really focused on growing some different aspects of the business that I thought would help us. But I would come back to problems that I thought were – pretty f- easy to diagnose and address and it was like where did this when i would try to assess the problem where did this go off the rails well i i, I don't know mm. lots of i don't knows and that tells me we didn't have process right and it that's where i started to see things go south i again hindsight 2020 right <laughs> But I would encourage younger entrepreneurs, newer, I would say, entrepreneurs who are starting their business, you have to keep, you have to think scale from day one. Mm. And I didn't. I just thought, I'm going to start a business. That's what you do. And I'm going to do this thing. And I did not think scale from the start. And it it's... Even if you've got 80% short-term focus, 20% long-term scale... Just keeping some of that in your view could prevent you from from making some larger mistakes. Oh, absolutely. So here in our house, we've invented uh, a person that when, you know, you find something in the kitchen, who left this out? Not me, not me, not me, not me. Well, someone broke into the house, got this out of the refrigerator and left it here. <laughs> and so we've invented a person that we blame that on because, yes, the mystery mistakes mystery are- mistake. Because mm. no one, there's no process. No one can claim yeah. responsibility. There isn't clear uh, job descriptions. Because to your earlier point, people that you bring inside start accepting roles that they may or may not be qualified for, mm-hmm. and are doing more than what their job requires. But there's no definition to that. Right. Right. So it's you know right now we have processes in place that nearly anyone could follow even if they aren't in that role which sounds crazy but it works and you know you and I are talking about a new project and what I say out the gate we're going to define objectives we're going to define what the deliverables are we're going to define what the measurable quality assurance markers are so that we can build process around it so Mm -hmm. that we can scale things immediately and it depersonalizes things and to tier one tier two employees that's hard it's very hard yeah and that that was another big big thing that we had to work through mm-hmm. but this was 
you know, 17, 18, 2018. So that's how many years ago. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. not that I was in business a long time before I reached that conclusion. Yeah. And so yeah. I encourage newer entrepreneurs to think scale, to depersonalize, think roles, not people. Yes. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That and that's the thing. Like you there, it, it, it was too long before I discovered process. And, and even then, you know, we lost someone that was almost like a sole source of knowledge. There was no process to replace. And so, yeah, you've got to think about that. People will come and go. What's going to make that transition easier is a defined role and process of here's what you do, here's how it's done. Even if you bring in a specialist, have them document. How are you doing this? You're, yes, and that again, that because can be if you're not here, yes, we need to know. Not, you know, not that you know if you're fired, but what if you're out for a couple of weeks with COVID? How how can we do this if you're not here? Yeah. Those types of things. Those are legitimate. I think as entrepreneurs, maybe we're afraid to ask people to document. You went through this. You were telling me about that. We need you to document what you're doing because we don't know. Right, and incredibly threatening. Yeah. To the people that we asked, again, mm -hmm. it, it removed their specialness. Mm -hmm. What what they didn't see was it didn't remove their specialness. In fact, it made them more valuable. Mm. And if they had just really thought through what we were trying to do, which was if you are sick, if you're out for three weeks with COVID, we've got to be able to do your work. Because mm -hmm. if we can't, there is no work and there's no paycheck for anybody, much less right. you. But yeah, it was it, it felt very threatening to people to have them define what they do. And every you know, my dad always said to me that, you know, everybody's replaceable. You know, you try to make yourself indispensable mm -hmm. wherever you go. That was right. one of his pieces yeah. pieces of advice was make yourself indispensable. But everybody, including me, is replaceable. People can go to other sources for they I there's nothing Mm -hmm. really truly unique about me and if if people can step out of that personal you know particularly in agencies i can only speak for agencies we got a lot of creative types mm -hmm. i'm a brilliant writer I'm, I'm not saying about me i'm saying people in my I, yes you are but i have to understand how you manage to please that client what do you diff do differently how do you how do you what's your process for thinking about that or what marks are you trying to hit mm. my process might be different but i've got to hit those marks every time and it was really threatening to a lot of my team members to say i need you to write down everything that you're going to do and we had other people who were not in those roles observe and they documented mm. what other people did yeah and would ask questions along the way why are you doing it that way once people got into the groove of that it became more comfortable yeah but it isn't comfortable when somebody's questioning why you're doing what you're doing well but the thing is this is only going to become more important because as family leave i mean here in the right. u.s that's going to expand like it or not it's going to happen yes and so be prepared for it you're going to have men and women leaving for family leave for months at a time right and i mean if you've gone through this you know how painful that could be yes uh that someone is gone for Three months at least, yeah, maybe more, and we've got to we've got to be able to fill that role. That is painful, absolutely. And if that's not documented, understood how that happens, so yeah, you could have people out with sickness, you could have people out on vacation, people out on leave. If the business is going to survive, that person being gone, you've got to have that contingency. You've got to have that plan for how this gets done so someone else can step in. Yeah. It, it's just going to increase the the need for that to happen. I can't s stress enough to newer entrepreneurs to document process and identify the roles in your business. And again, not people, the roles. You know, there is an accounting role. That role, you should be able to move from person to person pretty easily, right? But having all of those roles defined, even as you as you build your business plan, I'm not always sure that if I go out and look at business plan templates, because there's lots of them out there, right? There's lots of here, because if you're saying that there's a lot of Google searches, mm -hmm. right, for how to start a business, yeah. and they direct you to a bunch of paid ads on our business, business plan, plan approach. Oh. 
but do are roles part of those business plans? And I don't see them often. It's like here's here are here's my product or my service and defining that and here's my target audience that I'm gonna go to and here's my goal, which is by the way, a wish that yeah. you're going to hit X <laughs> amount of dollars in sales in X amount of time, right? But can you do you think through the roles, including who's gonna update my website content? Who's gonna update my social media content? Who's gonna manage while you're out trying to build relationships, mm -hmm. who's gonna do all those things? But role definition is a critical function and not really stressed, I don't think, enough yeah. to newer entrepreneurs. Well, and I think that's, you go into it thinking, I can make money doing this. Yes. I can make money and I can build a business. Okay, yes. How? Let's define this. Because you may find there's a ceiling and the only way you're going to double your income is by doubling people. Right. You, you know, there, there, there may be a human component to this. And so it's a matter of thinking through how are you going to scale this? What What's necessary? Are you driving the whole thing? Is this you and your personality? Right. It, it, you know, what, and I don't think business plans do a great, well. I never I, had I, one. I, I, me neither. <laughs> I've I, never had one. I, I think never I had one. started it and then reality set in. You, you know, I think it's one of those things that maybe forces you to look at a couple things, but reality is so different. I never had one and I I got asked often by business coaches who I've never hired. <laughs> but they, but, but they, what else are they going to have you do? They make you to justify what they do. Yeah, that's right. They make you feel like you're at a deficit if you don't have one, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. I I really went into it and I think a lot of entrepreneurs do this. I went oh. into it going I think that I I worked at a small agency and I was young. I mean, it was 22 when I joined that agency and it was the agency owner the office manager and me. And I got to see all aspects of the business, how we got it, how we did the work, how we build it, how we managed mistakes, how we worked with vendors. I saw the entire spectrum, right? And I thought, I could do this. <laughs> I could do this. And I think I would do it a little differently than she does it. Mm -hmm. And But I knew I needed big company experience. So I went to Progressive Insurance and worked inside a big company, which was invaluable right yeah because i wanted to serve large clients and i needed to understand what it was like to be on the inside and that really gave me that opportunity but i knew i just wanted to try it mm -hmm. and i and i viewed this and to this day i think i probably said this on the other podcast but i don't care i'll say it again to this day i went into it saying i believe that i'm employable if this thing blows up and fails i think i can go get a job and I would really like to work at a Hallmark store, which probably is now no longer exists. But, I love these stories. You know, Hallmark store, because I think selling greeting cards and fudge would be a fine job. I think I could guide people to the right cards for their moment, and I could make them happy by sharing with them some, you know, peppermint fudge. And I just always thought I could do, I could go get a job somewhere. And I still feel that way because our business has had ups and downs. I mean, no lie. The last three years have been challenging. Uh, 2019 was great. Actually, mm -hmm. 2019 was a stellar year. After after I went through the pain of 2018, but 2020, 2021, challenging, right? I'm still employable. But I wish that I, like, I, I so I, I think I just started it and went, oh, I'm just going to try this. I started the business with a fax machine, a landline hookup. <laughs> a computer and a telephone with really no foresight. <laughs> yeah, like, right. I wasn't thinking, I'm yeah. like, I'm going to try this thing before I have kids. And thankfully, when I went to Progressive and said, hey, I'm lit, I'm leaving, mm -hmm. but I'm not going anywhere. I'm just, I'm just going to go try this thing. I'll give you a month's notice because I'm not going to another job. I will leave everything in great shape. And two weeks into my like my my notice my boss came to me and said would you take half your job home with you nice yeah so progressive became my first client great amazing wow just amazing mm -hmm. but i also was like at that point business plan business plan is get set up so i can do this work yeah. that's it and off right. we went right absolutely but and that's no the thing i think that first year is just mainly 
I can make money doing this. Yeah. Because that's the other thing that nobody tells an entrepreneur. I didn't make money, make money. Yeah. Till 10 years in. Mm. And year one, I made $9,000. Ooh, ouch. Year one. Now, I don't, I don't know. I mean, thank God how we got our bills. Paid. Well, you, what you're saying is 9000 on the tax return. No. You're doing a 9000 That was year one. Revenue? Revenue. Oh, ouch. Yes. Wow. I remember the first check I got that had a comma in it. <laughs> that was a big deal. And wow. I left a really well, a really high paying job. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to go for it. Yeah. But I don't think, again, new entrepreneurs, they expect to be making, especially if they're leaving a mm. corporate position yeah. or a position that they've made decent money in, that they're going to make at least that amount right out the gate. No. That takes a while. Every yeah. entrepreneur I've talked to in EO never had that experience. Mm -hmm. Now, they might experience tremendous growth year two, or they might take off and, and they get there faster than I right, did. right. But you don't expect the loss, and there is loss, and there is mm -hmm. amazing sacrifice for that loss. Oh. That is, it's on 24-7. You are pounding the pavement. Mm -hmm. You're trying to build some structures. You're trying to have, you know, it, there's a lot going on in year one. Oh. And, I, well, I mean, cashed out 401k. Yes. I mean, that that's... Where, Rob, where else are you going to get money? Right. It, Rob did that for, you know, he, he started a mobile media company and with mobile technology, and that's what he did. Yeah. He cashed out 401k, and we when we merged, I mean, he had, he'd been doing it a couple of years or whatever, but we, we, you know, joined our efforts together. But I had been in business at that point 17 years, mm -hmm. something like that. It's But it's just not an expectation because you get a lot of rah-rah around you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go for it. That's really cool. The balance of that is it's a whole lot of work. It's all on you. And there is power in that decision. And there is loss of power in that decision. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There is no and paycheck. Especially if you have a family dependent upon yes. you. That's a whole... I, I, wow. That's why I think young people... <laughs> are, it's If you could be an entrepreneur as a young person, great do it if you have a family wow yes it you they, have to have an, you have to have that support but you also need how are you going to support them if you have some dry months yeah that's tough that is uh, that you have to know what you're getting into i mean what do they say most most i don't have a stat in front of me but most new businesses fail within three years before three years yeah and if you make it over the five-year mark that's pretty significant over seven mm-hmm that's crazy. And and I will say there's – so the entrepreneur organization – I do have a few stats. Um, so to be an EO proper, you have to make over a million dollars a year in, in revenue. And there is an EO accelerator program for those businesses that want to get to a million dollars. Hmm. Okay? When I joined uh, the, the Cleveland chapter, there's about 120 of us in Cleveland. There are 12 women. And I was shocked. It's like, that is yeah. crazy. Do, do not a lot of women know about this? Well, I started doing my homework. Globally, in EO, to be in EO proper, the uh, percentage of women is 13%. Wow. And now in EO Accelerator, it's 50-50. Wow. Oh, that's great. Wow. And so I've been doing a little bit of, of homework on that because I, I'm – challenged by that and a lot of times it comes down to the family decision mm. when i mean generally and this is this is not me you know speaking stereotypically it's what i've found in in the research uh, that i've done it's that when women's businesses reach a certain point where it's going to affect the family mm. they will back off well wow. because there's serious decisions to be made and and i can say that i mean we reached that point mm -hmm. there were decisions to be made and my husband came home and worked from home and and i don't i mean he he was we switched yeah. roles wow and i can't say enough how much that uh, that changed our mode and i couldn't have done that without mm -hmm. him but it's if you want to move to if you want to get your business to a certain size the sacrifices are real mm -hmm. and you have to 
determine what it is that you want to do with that. Yeah. And and only American Express did put this stat at only it's one percent of female business owners will reach million dollars in sales. Wow. Wow. So there are considerations. Mm-hmm. And I can say that there, you know, there have been a lot, there's been a lot that I've missed mm-hmm. in growing a business. And I'm fortunate that I had the, the structure at home to provide that. But yeah, I worked a lot. I still mm-hmm. work a lot. My kids know that. I have three kids. Yeah. And I just think that when you start, it's it's really exciting to start a business. But again, think scale at the beginning. And think about take into consideration if this grows to where I'm wishing it will in my business plan, <laughs> in my make believe business plan. Can I handle it personally? Can mm-hmm. I? Will I be able to weather? And will my family be able to weather things? And there, there is a lot. There's a lot of kind of shrapnel. Yeah. Along the way. Oh, um, absolutely. For for men and women. Yeah. Being business owners. Well, and that's one thing, and and this is why I would never trade it is. I, I realized I've gone through, I'm trying to think, two, I think third, I'm, I'm not, I've said this before, I've gone through three downsizings. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I've lost my job three times due to downsize, and I, I, I told myself, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm, I'm tired of being, because then you go to a new job, you're the, the what, it, like I got downsized, I went somewhere else. And then within six months, they had to downsize. But because I was the new employee, I, I was gone. Yeah. And I remember it was a, a couple of employees of mine went and got a bank loan for a house like that. No problem. I go to get a bank loan. Mm. And they're telling me, well, your business could go out and all that. Uh-huh. And I'm like, how can two of my employees get a bank loan faster and easier than me? Because let me tell you what things get rough guess who doesn't have a job they don't i it was and and that was just such a realization to me that i love what i'm doing am responsible for this and and <laughs> i have six employees i have six people that can get fired before i do <laughs> right know? and and that may be a cold calculating way to feel it but no You're i are absorbing all the i risk. have more i feel as though as an entrepreneur I have more safety and stability in my future and in my job than if I were working anywhere else on the planet. I agree. And cuz as I'm as I'm talking about the sacrifice here, I wouldn't change a thing. No. <laughs> because I am in the driver's seat mm-hmm. of my future, but I will say you're absorbing all of the risk for those six employees that you referenced. Mhm. Oh, so that's, again, that's a mental thing right there. Absolutely. Yeah, I have I have never lost sight of the fact that I have this payroll that I that I cover and that these people are depending on me. Mm-hmm. It's what gets me up in the morning. It's part of what gets me up in the morning. I mean, part of it is just I'm motivated. I still really love my job every day. I like going to my job every day, which mm-hmm. even that includes walking across my bedroom to my desk. I really love my job, but I also feel the weight of the responsibility for the people that are in my stead, right? But that's when I get a little annoyed, when I get resistance, because I'm absorbing all of the risk to have you employed by me. Uh, it's that it's that a few good men line, right? Yeah. You're going to <laughs> I'm going to give you the blanket of protection and you're questioning the way in which I provide it. Yeah. Right? Wow. And that is when you absorb the risk, you, you also get the benefits, but mm-hmm. you you are absorbing, you are taking on the risk. And that's why I mean we could kind of go back, keep going back to the start, but you having your cousin do your accounting and then seeing your your income grow, but not them recognizing that you are responsible for a payroll that is more than the money that you make. Yeah. And that you actually could make that money by mm-hmm. not having those employees. Yeah. You could you could redistribute, you could take on that that and do it because for most of us entrepreneurs, we've done the jobs for the people that we hire. Absolutely. Yep. That they they have a weird skewed view of your new car mm-hmm. or your new whatever, 
when every day you have the weight of people's livelihoods on your back and they're counting on you to show up and do for them. I mean, that is that is the rub as you gain employees and as you gain, you know, people like that. You, and again, you start out the business, you don't really yeah. see that. No. People come alongside. But then you're like, okay, every month I got to hit this number because that's payroll number. For mm-hmm. me, that's where we are right now because everybody's working from home. We're right. 100% remote now. We are not going back to the office. But that, so my biggest overhead is that payroll number. And yes, Matt, they are all it expendable. It will before always Before me. Be. Yeah. And I don't want to do that, but I will. It, so it, so don't make That's what a me. downsize is. <laughs> that's what a downsize is. A yeah. downsize is we have to eliminate positions to maintain payroll. And, and, and as, if you're going to grow a business, let me tell you, payroll is, is oh, so I got to tell you this. Yeah. I've done a lot of training for Microsoft, IBM, some of these larger companies, yes. and I'll work with their SMB group, their marketers. And when I start asking them, okay, what what is your SMB target? What's what's their need? What do they think about? And I, and I love it. I call it the brand hammer because, well, they need a singular solution that condenses all of their <laughs> word processing and database and CRM. And, and I'm looking at them like, that's what they need? Is that what they need? Well, what they need, and then, then again, they launch into the brand, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, let me tell you what an SMB owner needs. They need a day off. They need yeah. to make, <laughs> I said, let me tell you what, and what is most, what is in the mind of any SMB owner, payroll. Absolutely. I need to make payroll. And you're coming in selling a solution that if I buy this, I can't make payroll. Right. I said, so how are you going to justify this? I, I said, you are bringing the brand hammer and you're giving them all these benefits and, and words and all, all this. I'm like, but you do not understand the pressure, the decisions that an SMB has to make. And payroll is their number one consideration above all things and and it was interesting because you have people in the brand part. They've never owned a business. They don't understand that pressure. They right. don't understand it. They right. just think all they need to do is use the right words. You'll buy our stuff. Yeah. And so that's the corporate mentality. But I'll never forget business owner. There was another business and the owner and the staff there, I, I so respected them. They were a vendor and I was buying their software and we just built a friendship. And I remember one night over dinner, he's telling me, about how they're on a phone call and with a big client and it's like we've got to land this deal we've got to land this deal and the door opens and the bookkeeper just announces as the door opens we're not going to make payroll while they're on the conference call with this client (laughs) and they had oh she's such a kidder you know they had to kind of roll through that but he's telling me this and i I don't care about that situation. I'm looking at him, and the first thing in my mind is, you're concerned about making payroll too? Yeah. And it was such a liberating, wait, like, wait, I look up to you. Yes. You, you know, you guys are, it was such a liberating thing to realize that I'm not the only one. Right. Who, you know, stresses about this. It was such a, oh. Yes, that's. Uh, you I deal with this too. That's why, that's why I love EO. Mm. Because I found that the whether they were the stories in my head or my realities were not my own Mm. and i'm sitting in a group of people that have businesses that are larger than mine some a little smaller than mine all sharing the same pains and so we don't get in a group and commiserate about Mm -hmm. the pain we try to solve the problem but anytime one person in that group shares about an issue like meeting payroll we all learn because we all have the same problems. And it's it's something that I would say if you're if you're starting a business, surround yourself with other business owners so that yeah. you have the ability in a safe place, right, mm-hmm. to say I'm struggling with this thing and have somebody who can go, oh, "I get you." Right. And not I feel badly for you, but to really understand at that at that empathetic level of oh an experience-based mm-hmm. level. I've had the same experience yeah. as you. 
that you can talk through things and know you're not alone. It's it's a very lonely walk. It can be. Entrepreneurship's lonely. And and part of the reason that Enio they challenge us to share at a five percent level. So he said they say most people we share uh, and that's good or bad. Mm-hmm. We share we'll we'll share good and we'll share bad with people, but there's five percent of bad we won't share with anybody. And there's five percent of good we won't share with anybody. Mm. Because you you can't. Yeah, you can't go to a family friend or a friend and say, "I just landed a big deal." Mm-hmm. You know, I just I just landed a million dollar deal. They, you can't do that. Yeah, you also can't tell them I lost a million dollar deal. <laughs> right. Well, and and this is one thing like you learn about taxes. <laughs> like a million dollar oh, deal does not mean I get a million dollars. No, no. <laughs> it means then- as the owner, I might see. Hundred, <laughs> and the, and the and then you factor in payroll. You factor in all those things, but it you can't go yeah. there. So having trusted advisors, people use yeah. that term in every industry. But truly, as you start a business, surrounding yourself with other business owners who you trust, who can have shared experiences, who will keep things confidential. I I just say find that group. Mm-hmm. There are industry groups like that. There are, you know. Groups like like EO, there's there, but but do that because a business coach is not going to be that person. No, they're there to sell you their services. They are a vendor. Mm-hmm. You want people that have no financial connection to absolutely to weigh in on some of your decision making, and you need that. That goes back to that logical, yeah. non emotional, clinical perspective. You're going to need that. Yep, and and I think it's it's absolutely necessary. That you just realize other people deal with this. Yes. It's not you. It's not. No. You have a trouble making payroll? So does, you know, yeah. half of, more than half of organizations under, you know, 20 to 30 people. Hey, even big corporations have trouble making payroll right. too. It's, it is a common thing. And just to, that, that li- it doesn't solve things, but it lifts some of that weight. And and that I think is an entrepreneur so so important is, is like you said you're carrying weight that I have this many people dependent upon this money coming right. in and this business succeeding. One of the things so I took advantage of the in the U.S. we have SCORE Service Corps of Retired Entrepreneurs. Oh, that's an excellent resource. So valuable to talk with someone else who's been in the trenches. And I went out of pure frustration because. <laughs> I went through salespeople like tissue. I <laughs> I had people come in and promise I can do this, I can do, you know, and I'm like, fine. I got to the point where I'm like, you want to work for me? Come work for me, commission only. You reach a certain amount of commission, I will guarantee your paycheck. Because I just got so tired of people overestimating their sales ability. But part of it is, and you know, I was more on the digital marketing side. So what I'm selling has a digital technical component. You need to be able to see, analyze, and go from there in order to sell it properly. And I went and talked to SCORE and talked to some of the representatives. And I'll never forget the one guy looked at me. He says, Matt, you're the salesperson. (laughs) Yes. Don't waste time hiring people to do what you do best. And that's when I realized... I need back office. You need the engine running. I'm, I need back office. Yeah. I can't do that. And 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 part of it too was embracing this. But I like that part. I like being out there. I like making right. the sale. I like doing the, you know, sort of on the spot analysis. Well, here is your problem. You, you know, Me too. I love that. That's it. Yeah. But I needed to be able to hand it off. Yeah. And let it go. And, and that so... transition wasn't happening. Yeah, it, I mean, it. I went through yes. Then after that, developing more back office processes, things like that. Yeah, but you're right. The sales uh, that I I reached the same conclusion. Now I can say that in EO, I've met some some business owners who are not the salesperson, mm-hmm. and because I thought that was kind of the only way it was. Right? <laughs> right. Again, you're in your you're in your own head and your own experience. So I have found organizations where they're not. The salesperson, and that's interesting. But they do fill a unique role. They fill a, not a unique role. They fill a specific role mm-hmm. in the organization. They started out as salesperson, 
but ultimately move back. I, I agree with you. And I had to come to terms with that too, that I, I am the driver mm-hmm. of those things. And I really like it too. And I almost didn't want to embrace that. I liked yeah. that. Same here. I don't, well, I don't know why that I felt guilty about that. I felt like I should be able to do the other things well, or, or just not. It's hard work. But Sales I, is hard. Yeah. Especially telling creative. Yeah. It's hard. And it's one of those things where I don't want to do it every day. I think that's part of it Maybe. is I need to unplug. And for me to unplug is I'll go optimize that site. I, I you know, <laughs> I'll do that because now I can unplug. I don't have to interface with people. I, I, I can just sharpen my skills. I think mine was a little different. I think that mine was that I somehow devalued that that the yeah that because i'm good with people and it's easy for me it's it's an easy it's natural for mm-hmm. me to to do those things that somehow it wasn't hard enough like i would say mine's the opposite oh, yeah. that i i thought that the harder work was back at the office and i should be doing that stuff mm. when i let myself go and go no i need to be out mining some new opportunities that's when i got criticism from my team hmm. that's when i was gallivanting because I wasn't sitting at my desk doing things. Right, right. But what they didn't see was that they didn't have the ability to broker those relationships that I do. I, I, right. I'm a relationship broker. And I have, I would also say, I'm a, I mean, I'm definitely a strategist. I do the same thing you do as I go in and assess almost immediately what people need. Mm-hmm. So there's that part too. But I guess I think because it came natural to me and easy to me, that somehow it wasn't as valued. Oh, I get that. I and, yeah, I completely understand that. And now I I do. I recognize yeah. the value of it and and I now have a team and a business partner who are like, "No, she needs to be powered and untethered." Yes. Untethered to go do those things and we back here need to be able to take care of anything she brings to us. That's it. So yeah. that's a good well, balance. And I think salespeople in general tend to be devalued because of that. That yeah. they're never here. They're never doing the hard work. They're out golfing. Yeah. I got news for you. <laughs> business is done on the golf course. I can say that. Oh, it's it's business is done twenty four seven. If you're in sales, she's it, yes, it, I am. Yes, making sales, probably selling something. Yeah, and so so there's a couple things I want to. We're, we're I don't even know where we are in time. I don't either. This is a really good uh, conversation, yeah. though. Really, I I myself. I mean, there are moments here that we've talked. I'm like light bulb, light bulb, and that's that's another I think aspect of the entrepreneur is. We like to learn. Mm-hmm. We we are changing people. I don't know many entrepreneurs that are completely set in their ways. Oh, yeah. Everyone that I've met in EO, and I'm talking global now, mm-hmm. are these morphing, changing people who adapt. Yeah. We're very adaptable, and we like the new. We're always pursuing the new. So th- I, I'm learning through this conversation. I went back to school and got my master's degree. <laughs> yeah. And And- you know, thank goodness At I did. At which point did. I went, what? I know. But now, now it makes a lot of sense. I know, which was funny because, dear listener, I didn't finish my degree. <laughs> I, I, I didn't finish my degree, and for years I never went back and finished. And when I did finally get it, <laughs> I went and got a master's Because <laughs> I kind of, when you told me that, I was like, what? Because, and but now it makes complete sense to what you're doing, and it's yeah. really adding value to what you're oh. doing. But at the time, I was like, you're doing what? But I do that that love for learning. Mm-hmm. I mean. I... Well, and it was a complete shift or pivot, as you like to use. It, yeah. I went from agency, from from service agency to training agency. Yeah. And I needed that structure to learn the structure of training and to learn how do you create good training. Yeah. And how do you measure learning? That was an absolute essential. I had to have that. And and it's transformed how I teach. It's transformed everything. It's been a, such a wonderful thing. And so it's another thing I think as an entrepreneur is wait for the pivot. It'll happen. Yeah. You, you've done it. Yeah, I have. And But I, I do think that that's one common trait. Yes. If you don't, if you think you're going to go into something and you're going to do something and it's going to be consistent and it's not going to change... <laughs> don't start a business yeah. because we are doing things. Well, every year there was something new that came along. Now we're doing that. Uh, well, oh, we're doing this now. Clients. Yeah. If you have clients, 
they're going to drive your focus. Yeah. Yeah, uh, continually. Now, the only thing I, I haven't, we haven't kind of covered, we've covered more agency and, which I think covers a, a good deal. But, you know, one of the things, especially because of COVID, which is increasing, is the service economy. Yeah. That's where a lot of people are starting businesses, delivery, delivery-based businesses, service-based businesses of, you know, I ran into someone, they're making meals and delivering them. Yeah. Wow. You know, okay, and 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 so immediately, my brain's like, "How's that going to scale? How are yeah. you going to scale that? What's what's your plan? What are you going <laughs> to, you know?" And and you, I hate to put people on the spot because yes, I want to be excited for you. You're doing great. How are you going to ext? And, and again, same thing though. How are you going to extract yourself from being the engine? To right. Being the- I I realize this. This is what I. I've been promoted out of every job I enjoy. And there's a difference between loving the job you do and managing the job you do. Mm. I absolutely loved when I was in the army, I was a medic. And then I got promoted. And I got promoted into a sergeant role, which means now I had to supervise medics. And let me tell you, they're a bunch of undisciplined, unfocused <laughs> people. They were you. <laughs> it was me. I, I don't want to manage me. I, exactly. That's what it was. And that was my first experience. Is I loved being a medic. I loved the freedom. I loved learning and yeah. going and seeing. And now I got to manage me? No. And now, and then it happened again. I went to another company, loving what I'm doing. Okay, now we want you to manage this group. Of, I don't want to manage me. I don't. I, I think that that was just this realization is there's I love what I do, but I don't want to manage people who do what I love. It's a big yeah. difference. And so when you start this business, yeah, it's exciting. You're making money. Things are happening sooner or later. If you want it to grow. Yes. You're going to have to manage what you love instead of do it. That's a really, really big shift. Uh, that's an excellent consideration. And if entrepreneurs can again look far look far enough ahead to the time where they would be managing what they love Mm -hmm. it is a it's a whole different deal i don't mind the management as much we've had this discussion oh yeah uh, yeah. (laughs) but but there always is even to this day so again 25 years in i will see something done from one of my team members and go I would never have done it that way. Why did you mm-hmm. do it that way? Mm-hmm. To this day. And there's times I have to just let it go and go, it's GE, it's good enough. <laughs> it's good enough. Let that roll. But it is it is a different mindset and it does not give you the same enthusiasm, the same energy that you have when you're the one executing all the time. Mm-hmm. I com- that, that is something nobody talks to entrepreneurs yeah. about. And I, I think that that's a, a really, you should get that trademark, the distinction of doing the thing you love versus managing the thing you love. Yeah. It, that is a shift and something that, I think that's maybe, maybe that's why, maybe that's the three-year mark. Oh, yeah. I, I can see that. When yeah, you, you can't when shift you into that. When you first bring a couple employees on those early employee days mm-hmm. where you're handing off something that you would normally have been doing to someone else. And you have to manage what you love instead of do what you love. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to do it the same. And they don't do it the same. And you get hung up on that. That could be a, a very That's, big reason yeah. why. Because I, I would say it was around the, well, I didn't start hiring until six years in. But most businesses, I would think, would start sooner than I did. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a that was an early observation of... You know, I, I I hate being successful because I don't want to manage. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to goof around and, <laughs> and be the irresponsible one. Yeah. I don't want to be the manager. I also yeah. think that there's a there's a perspective there too as you move into a management role. Again, you've got more eyes on you on what mm-hmm. you're doing and what your time is spent, and what those eyes never see is the sleepless nights that you have wondering about payroll. They don't see. <laughs> 
they don't see a lot of they just see what you want them to see because you're managing and you're trying to create culture and you're trying to create a good work environment and you don't want to put your burdens on them that's if they if they want those burdens they could go try this themselves yeah, right right but what they don't they don't see you got more scrutiny now as a manager than what you had just just you or just you know or outsourcing to somebody that's not in your employ. Yeah. But that's, I, I'm going to be noodling on that for mm-hmm. the difference between loving what you do and managing what you do. Yeah. That's, that's a really good distinction. Well, it, it's, so we'll, we'll finish with this is, is I absolutely hate the term and I, I want to bounce it off to you because I, it makes my skin crawl side hustle or the hustle culture. It makes my skin crawl. Side, I hate it. Side hustle. Like everyone's saying you got to have a side <laughs> hustle and, and, and it's the hustle culture. And, and I, I reacted to this on LinkedIn and it's actually caused some, I I cannot stand this emphasis on side hustle and no, put it this way. I can't stand the phrase because it's, especially with the digital economy, there's so many ways you can make money. You are no longer limited to a single income stream. Even as an employee, You've got skills, you've got hobbies, you've got talents that you can develop and create an additional income stream. I think calling it a side hustle cheapens that. That's what I was, uh, my first thought was it's a cheap term. Yes. So I didn't articulate that, but that's, yeah. It cheapens what you do. Yeah. Because no, this is just the the reality of a new digital based economy. Yeah. For example, my daughter's a photographer. She logged in the other day and realized, oh, I made money on stock photo sites by uploading some photos a year ago. I'm like, so you're not continuing to upload photos? Do you realize if you maintained a library, a catalog, that a couple hundred could turn into a couple thousand? Could turn into, yeah. I'm like, and why are you on one site? You know, and it's, it's and, and I hate dealing with these creative types. <laughs> they never feel, think about not money. Feeling it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So no, but then again, so and and so it took me sitting with her. Okay, as a photographer, we've got stock photo sites. Also, when you're selling your photos, you know you can create and and we signed up. There's I can upload my photos. So if you do a wedding, you can upload all the photos and you can have this business site. Where people can, I want that size. I want it in that frame. Yeah. I want it. Now, you are not doing the selling. People are logging in. They're selling themselves right. on what they want, and and it handles and recurring hands off revenue. That's it. And then you know we're looking. What are other ways? What are other channels that you can apply this to? And so if you've got a talent or another example, I'm we've got an employee here. I've got her working on a very specific software package for training and education. Mm-hmm. She's good. I mean, and part of it is she has a design and programming background. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. Perfect. And so as she's going through this, I told her, you get a few of these projects under your belt, we're going to put you on Fiverr and sell your services on Fiverr. Yeah. And, and you know, and immediately the look of fear. Yes. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Because you need to develop more income than just what you're making from me. Something that you can do if if you leave, you go somewhere, you move. Yeah, you can do work for me, but guess what? You do work for someone else too. There is opportunity like I've never seen before. Oh, yeah. To do things that I, I couldn't have imagined. So I understand the search for starting a new business, right? Mm-hmm. But there are so many... Uh, so many opportunities out there right now and i think that we as entrepreneurs we we can't help but see them for other people yeah we can't help right. <laughs> we can't help but go you know what you could do and i i get i get accused of being bossy or that i'm i'm i had i had one person I, that came to me and said that they're thinking about changing careers and i'm like oh, you could do this you could do this and they were all they were all business startups right i can't help but think that because I would say, no, don't go work for somebody. Take what I know you can do and do this. And he said to me, I'm not you. Mm -hmm. I don't want what you want. Mm -hmm. I want steady and I want predictable. And I'm like, the only way you get steady and predictable is if you're managing yourself. To your point of Mm -hmm. 
you're at the mercy of some other company, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I, I will say that I think COVID has brought about the opportunity oh. for entrepreneurs. And I agree with you. Don't devalue making a couple hundred bucks on something you do well. Think about how you turn that hundred bucks into thousands. Mm-hmm. And there are ways. Oh. There are so many ways to do that. And I, I really think it's ripe for anybody at any age. I mean, when people are getting paid to commentate on things on YouTube, mm-hmm. you know, and I then mean, commentate on the commentators on YouTube. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's so I went to Fiverr and I bought a music riff that was custom. I'm like, here's what I need. Here's kind of what I'm looking for. So musicians on uh, anyone. Yeah. Just go look at Fiverr and look at what people are selling the services. I I love, love these gig. Yes. These gig sites. And I've had to learn, like you, Sue, I will no longer say to anyone what you should do. No. I will no. No. My other daughter gives me the eye. Yeah. I've gotten, I've gotten a, again, an, in entrepreneur organization language, we always talk about in my experience. We experience share. We don't tell people what to do. Mm. So we say, you know, in my experience or in the past, I did this and I didn't think about that mm. In to present ideas in ways that are not me just being – my exuberance overtakes because yeah. I get really excited for people. And it's really <laughs> like I don't give a rip whether or not you actually take my advice. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm just excited for you at the possibility. And I think that that's what entrepreneurs do. We get excited at opportunities. And there's a big difference between opportunity and possibility. Yes. There's lots yes. of possibilities. There's well, very few opportunities. Yeah. Again, that's, that, is, uh, that, that is Rob. Again, my balance here as Rob is always, I'll be like coming back to him going, hey, I talked to this person today. Oh, just hit. Idea man. Oh. And he goes, <laughs> that's a possibility. Right, my but wife calls me not, idea man. Might not be a might not be an <laughs> yeah. opportunity, and and that's another thing that entrepreneurs need to determine is what is the path I'm going down a possibility or is it a true opportunity? Mm-hmm. And I think there are today lots of possibilities. Yes, that could become opportunities, but you've got to make them yours. Yeah, and side hustle, you're right, completely cheapens true opportunities. Oh, well, and, and early in my agency, whenever I would hire someone. The onboarding process was, okay, go create a WordPress site. Here's my server. I want you to do everything. You can come, ask for advice, but you need to read the instructions. You need to know how to install it. You need to know how to put a theme on it and and develop it and create a blog. You know, the looks I would get were just- You didn't hire me for that. Yeah, exactly. No, you're a copywriter. Yeah, you need to know how to do this. Yeah. So create it. And it was, I want you to build something that you're passionate about. What do you like? What do you what are you passionate about? What could you write about and give your opinion about for the next couple of years? That was the challenge. They would do that. Then after a couple months and and started getting it started, it was like, okay, now phase two. I want you to make money with it. How are you gonna make money with this? And that I thought was it was a challenge, but what was amazing is how many different ways people found yes some found youtube youtube commissions and they went that route others put ads on their site because they were driving page views and ads were a great way to do that some i'm trying to think there was a couple i'm trying to think that just the different ways ebooks yeah they... were one even taking old blog posts turning them in ebooks selling them out there here's the thing we got we landed one of our biggest most long-term clients off of one of those projects. There you go. That that was financially worth everything. But what it does to them internally, oh. how it how it bolsters true teamwork. You want culture? Mm-hmm. Build it off that. Yeah. You want you want camaraderie? Build it off a Everyone's project like that. Everyone's learning from each other. Yeah. We had more innovation because the analyst is doing analyst things to try and figure things out. He figures it out, shares it with everyone else. They implement it. Oh, wow, yeah. Copywriters, SEO, they're figuring things out. They're sharing it with everybody else. Oh, YouTube, they're, they're, they're figuring out some algorithms on YouTube and how things are working and here's how we're... And so everyone is increasing their skills. Yeah. 
So it increased our innovation, it increased our clients. And also the policy that I had was you can work on this. You can use our software, you can use our tracking, do all that. And when you leave, you can take it with you because it's yours. It's not mine, it's not the company's. You have taught yourself how to do this. And I'm amazed at how many of them still have their sites. They're making money. The best story is I had an intern who had a site, put ads on it, started making close to $10,000 a month. And then he retired. (laughs) (laughs) At 23. That works. From, I think, from an entrepreneur. And I've shared this story with other people. To some people, it scares them as an as the business owner that I felt that empowering my employees, teaching them how to be an entrepreneur, how to make money, how to build skills, I felt that was the way to go. And I was ultimately very rewarded by that. But to others, there is this mentality that I can't teach them everything. I don't want them to know everything or I don't want to empower them to they'll leave they'll go somewhere else yeah fear i never lost one employee to a competitor never because i was focused on their development their benefit and they knew that yeah recently did something similar where rob actually invented a product and then went to our team and said you're taking this product to market that includes getting it trademarked listed on amazon all the way through and the same kind of thing where you're they're learning all the techniques Mm. of all the things that they need to and all the pitfalls right and in the end people would look at that and go you're 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 giving them the keys to the kingdom yeah we are Mm -hmm. yeah because we 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 are in the same boat as you and and i completely agree with that mentality but it is very unusual i don't Mm -hmm. i think it's pretty rare and fear Fear will keep you from growing your business. Yeah. You know, you it's weird. You take the risk and you start the business and then you stop yourself in fear after you've grown it to a certain size. Like <laughs> right. you're gonna, like you're gonna protect it at that size yeah, or yeah. something like that. But I love that you did that with your people and that and it builds it builds loyalty, it builds trust. And again, I hate the word culture anymore. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't invent one. It becomes its own. Yeah. But you, if you want culture, you know, you want to create a unique culture, give your people the ability to innovate and execute with you and become mini entrepreneurs and watch what that does to trust, communication, oh. all the things that- Why would you ever leave? That people want prescribed yeah. for their organization rather than experienced by their organization. You try and lock employees down and they will leave. Yeah. You try and- extract resources from them without investing and they will leave you treat them like people and you grow them like you're growing your business they'll follow you anywhere yeah it's it, it, it it enables it empowers and when people feel that and that's value that's value you're treating people with value and that's what will keep them there if you're scared of losing them you'll lose them yeah, I agree. That that mentality will that will create culture. Yeah. And and yeah, the culture is a direct reflection of how you treat people. Absolutely. What a great way to end. <laughs> this is really good. It is. I I just looked at the clock and this I think we may have clocked our longest podcast. Oh well. Well, it felt it felt short. So. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thank you, Sue. I appreciate you making the time today. I am happy to be here, and we'll have to think about the next topic to address. Absolutely. I I think I've got a few in my notes here that we'll have to come back around. Sounds good. (laughs) All right. Hey, listener, thank you for checking in with us here at the Endless Coffee Cup. Always a pleasure. And I look forward to speaking to you. Hey, dear listener, thank you so much for checking in with us at the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. And keep learning. And I hope you've refilled your coffee cup a couple of times for this episode because I think it's a long one. Thanks again. We'll see you soon.
This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.